Happy Mother's Day. And welcome to all the kids who are in the service this morning. It is a family service, so that means we're all here together to worship and to read God's word together. You know what? Mother's Day is a special day. And, of course, I have to speak about my own mother, right? <laughs> I am actually thankful for my grandmother. Uh, if you guys didn't know, my grandparents, they came over from the Philippines. And so I inherited my love for food, particularly Filipino food, from my grandmother. <laughs> I had a, uh, we had a, a, a lolo and a lula, which is a weird way because when I met other Filipinos, apparently it's lola and lulu. Or I don't know. We all have different ways of saying it. But my kids now, they have my grandmother, they call Apo, and then I have, we have a grandpa and Lola as well. And speaking of my kids, Lola, as I call her my mother, from her, I inherited my love for cooking and food. And I'm sure you guys all have learned wonderful things from your mother that you carry with you, and even from your grandmother. My grandmother would pick me up from school sometimes, and, you know, being a kid, I'd be pretty hungry and she'd take me down to McDonald's sometimes, or even Taco Bell. And that's when I learned that I could eat an entire Big Mac by myself. And I knew that I had grown up just a little bit. <laughs> I still love eating, and I still love cooking. And of course, I have to give a shout out to my own wife, Bethany. Happy Mother's Day. She takes care of our kids. I love her to bits. And I hope this puts me in the good books, yes? <laughs> You're not supposed to use a pulpit for personal gain, right? <laughs> But anyways, I just want to say we honor our moms, our grandmothers, our aunties, our big sisters, those who have cared for us and nurtured us. Now, we have our children here with us in the service today, and they are a gift from the Lord. But some days, it doesn't quite feel like a gift, does it? Have you ever gone on a family road trip before? Yeah? What about you kids? You guys enjoy going on road trips? No? You're shaking your heads? <laughs> So what is the one thing that we always hear when we're on a road trip? Are we there yet? <laughs> I'm bored. <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Or maybe, I have to pee. <laughs> road trips. They're wonderful, aren't they? They bring out the best in our children and our mothers and our fathers. As a kid... My parents would love taking us to the beach. I grew up in Northern California, and sometimes we would go to Stinson Beach, which was known for its shark attacks. <laughs> but don't worry, I never got bit by a shark. But there was also another beach right next to it called Muir Beach, and Muir Beach is wonderful. It's nestled in between these cliffs, and in order to get down to that beach, you have to take a long, winding road. Have you guys ever been on a winding road before? Yeah, did any of you guys ever get car sick? Yeah, my sister Christina, she would get car sick sometimes, uh, but she, she did this trick. She would always have like an orange with her, and she would scratch the peel and take sniffs. And this, I guess, would help her with her, uh, her car sickness, I guess, you know. But when we were a kid, we also had a dog. We got a dog when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old, and um, we were great with pet names, let me tell you. Uh, when I was a kid, I had uh, a snake called Snakey. And I also had a, a turtle called Timmy and a cat named Tigger. So you want to guess what we named our dog? We named her Sarah. <laughs> now, animals with, or pets particularly with human names are great, aren't they? Right? You could imagine as my dog would run away down the street or screaming after her, Sarah, come back, Sarah, get back in the house. People are like, who, who is this kid, Sarah, running around the neighborhood? It was actually my dog. Anyway, so we would bring this dog with us down to the beach, you know, by the time we got her. And uh, just like my sister Christina, Sarah could get car sick. And so sometimes we'd be going down this windy road, and you'd see her in the back seat kind of going back and forth like this. And sometimes you would see the drool going. And Sarah, let me tell you, bless my mom and my dad, she would just lose her lunch. And sometimes she would lose yesterday's lunch as well. That yeah, means both ends, right? Oh, so we'd get down to the beach, and we'd have to clean out the back of the station wagon. But I remember these road trips, right? Because it wasn't about that windy road or about the vomity dog, but it was about getting to the beach, right? And finally getting there. And you have to endure all the whining and complaining. And let me tell you, I struggled with it 
as a kid too. I often would come to my mom and I'd be like, Mom, I'm bored. You guys ever said that to your mother before? Is it your mother's responsibility to find you something to do? (laughs) Well, you sure seem to like to make it her responsibility, right? So, despite this, road trips can have great memories, even with all the whining and complaining. See, sometimes we like to test our parents to see if they are keeping their promises. Now, kids are pretty good at sniffing out promises you have forgotten. Yeah? They like to hold you to the letter of the law. I know, my kids... They even like to add conditions to the promises that I made that I never even promised in the first place, testing my own memory. (laughs) Yes, the kids are good at holding us to our promises. Now, I struggled with grumbling, complaining, and sometimes I even complain to God about the things I don't like. Have you guys ever done that before? It'd be better if things were just a little bit like this, or maybe you've just had an emergency, whether it be a flat tire or something more serious. And it's easy, right, to come to God with the grumbling and the complaints in the middle of that journey. Sometimes I even try to make deals with God. You guys ever done that before? Just like you try to make deals with your mom or your dad. You're like, Mom, Dad, if you get me this thing, I promise to do all this, right? We do that with God sometimes. I know I have. I'm like, God, if I, I promise to, to follow these things and do these things, if I could just have this thing. Right? We all have that thing that we're itching for. And so sometimes we make those deals. But we really shouldn't be testing God this way, should we? We know that God has already made us promises, right? And where can we find his promises? In his word, in scripture, right? I know I'm not the only one that struggles with grumbling and complaining. Sometimes it's easier just to despair. Do you guys know what despair is? It's like when you look at your situation, you're like, whoa, is me. Now, I know you guys don't say whoa, right? Sometimes you're like, just make a sound. You just go, ugh. And you're just like, ugh. Or maybe even get a little bit angry and annoyed. But it's easy to despair when difficult things happen. When things get hard, it's much easier to just throw your hands up in the air. But what I'm telling you today is that's actually a form of laziness. See, we all struggle with grumbling and complaining. In fact, I believe that North America has what I like to call an outrage culture. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You ever feel like when you just look outside, there's people who are just outraged over everything? They're like, the traffic! Ah! Right? Or you go to the line. I just went to the store yesterday to get a gallon of milk, and it's almost $6. And I'm like sitting at the milk window just like, ah! This milk is like $6. Price is going up, right? It's easy just to despair. It's much harder to do something about it. The internet is filled with venting and complaining and rants. I'm sure you guys have all heard those things online. Go ahead and pick your affinity group. There's something to whine about, isn't there? Rage bait is out there. In fact, it's a business model for websites and news outlets to put things out there to purposely make us rage about it, to be upset, right? It gets more clicks, it gets more likes, it gets more views. Anger is across all our screens from TV news to social media. So why are we prone to complaining? But why are we also reluctant to find solutions to our problems? Now, during an emergency, it can feel really good right, to have an outburst. The acute despair that we feel can also relieve us of feeling like we are responsible for our problems or responsible even for our attitudes, right? Our attitudes and our actions matter in the situations that we're faced in. We don't want to be responsible for our problems, so we complain to the management, right? So if you're a kid, who's your manager? Yeah, your parents, right? You like to come to your parents and complain, you know what, I don't like the atmosphere of this place. You know what, I don't like the food. Uh, Waiter, excuse me, mom, uh, I ordered plain chicken, and this one has seasoning on it. Yeah? How many of you guys have done that before? Now take that a step further. Who's the management in our lives? It's God, right? The Lord. It's easy to come to him and say, excuse me, Uh, This isn't what I ordered. I ordered the good life. Uh, Can you take this back to the kitchen? 
but no. Despair feels like satisfying to us in a way because it's at least an extreme response to extreme moment, right? It's a release to be able to just, you know, let out and grumble and complain and like, ah, this thing happened and now I'm going to have this big response and outburst. I know my kids are like that sometimes. I'm like, please just go pick up your dirty socks. Ah, right? I don't want to put my shoes by the door. These huge outbursts, it just, it's a bit of a release, and we often can do that. We can have that despair in our lives, but that despair is laziness, just like the kid who don't want to pick up his socks. Sometimes we don't want to take responsibility for our attitude in the situation of the problems that we face. It's also lazy because it's the emotional equivalent of retweeting something in lieu of actual activism. Maybe you guys spend time in Twitter. I don't. I don't have a Twitter account. I hear it's terrible. Kids don't get a Twitter account, okay? But some people go on there, and there's a cause or something big, and it's easy just to retweet. It's easy just to share. It's easy to say, this is important, but I'm not going to do anything about it, right? Because that's often sometimes how we face our problems with whining and complaining and grumbling, is that we can just bring a lot of attention to the situation without actually taking any activism, taking any responsibility for our attitudes and actions. We all struggle with grumbling and complaining. And so today, we're going to look at what God's Word says about this. So if you guys have your Bibles with you, I'm going to invite you to open them up to Exodus chapter 17, and we're just going to look at verses 1 to 7. And this is about the Israelites as they quarreled or grumbled and argued and complained and tested the Lord. Now, I have the words up here on the screen, so if you guys want to follow along, I'm going to pause, and during that pause, I want you guys to say the next word, okay? Let's go ahead and try out the first. Out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord... Excellent. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to... So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water too. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the? And Moses replied, why do you quarrel? Sorry, I already read that line. Verse 3. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff which you struck the and I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to... So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or? Yeah, we have a short little story here. This is about the Israelites as they're traveling through the wilderness. And what do they want? They want water. You know, they're grumbling, complaining. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. So who's the management that they go to? They go to Moses, right? Now, if you're a parent, maybe sometimes there's a, one of you two that the kids always go to for stuff, right? You usually try to go to the one that's going to give in, isn't it? Yeah. So during this time, the Lord would follow the Israelites around in a cloud of what? What was it? A cloud of fire at night, right? And a pillar of clouds during the day. Now, does that sound like a normal thing that you would see in the desert? No. It would show the power and the strength of the Lord. But when the people of Israel were thirsty, did they go to the pillar of fire? Is that the management they wanted to complain to? No. Who did they go to? They went to Moses. They're like, Moses, give us water. And he's like, what what am I supposed to do with these people? They were were ready to stone him. They were grumbling and complaining and not taking any responsibility for their attitudes or actions. 
Not only did the Israelites demonstrate doubt in God's provision, they also tested him because of their complaints and their distrust in the Lord's promises. By the time we get to this scripture, this is like the third time that they grumbled and complained against the Lord. A third time. After experiencing the plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, the Lord's provision of both food and water in the form of manna, bread from heaven, the people of Israel are grumbling and complaining again. They are showing a hardness of heart, just like Pharaoh and the Egyptians, whom they just left. Do you guys remember when Pharaoh hardened his heart? All right? And there was consequences for that. Now, Psalm 95 also has something to add to this story. So we're going to look at Psalm 95 as well. So I'll give you guys just a moment to turn there. And we're going to read verses 7 through 11. Now, once again, you guys can pause. Sorry, I will pause, and you say the words, right? So here we go. This starts in verse 7 in the middle. It says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice, Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massah, in the where our ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my... So I declared on oath in my... They shall never enter my... Yeah, so this comes later in Psalm 95. But here we see God is speaking through the psalmist. And he says that their hearts had become hard, right? Now, we often think things being hard is strong in strength, right? Like a show me your muscles, right? Strong, hard muscles is what we want. But our heart, is that something that we want to be hardened? No. A strong heart, in this case, is actually a heart that is soft to the Lord, one that isn't hardened because of the grumbling and complaining. So what should we do about this? You know, when we look through the Bible, we look at the biblical scholars, the people who wrote the Bible as well, we get this idea that heart is not just the muscle in your chest, right? We're not talking about the thing that pumps blood. We're talking about the things inside of us that we know are real, that we can't touch, that we can't see. Our heart is the central core of our thoughts, our feelings, and our choices. And so to harden this heart is to make it dull and unresponsive to God and to strengthen it in disbelief. Our hearts can become hard as rocks if we are not careful. Ever hear the expression, like getting blood from a stone? Is that a possible task? No, it's impossible. You go outside, you pick up a rock, you squeeze it as hard as you can. Are you going to get blood from that stone? No. But God, God is able to get water from a rock, isn't he? Impossible tasks like water from a rock, our hearts can become hard like rocks. But thankfully, even God can get water from a stone. So we have hope, don't we? That if we find ourselves today in a place where our hearts are hardened towards the Lord, God can soften those hearts. God can do wonderful things. He can bring water from a stone. You know what's kind of crazy if you guys look in the grocery aisle? I was just talking about milk. But there's all kinds of milk out there, isn't there? Right? Can you imagine that somebody looked at an almond one day and said, I'm going to milk it? Or looked at some oats and said, I'm going to milk that too. There's all kinds of milk out there. Do you think God ever looks down on us and says, I gave you such wonderful animals to get milk, and you're squeezing it from almonds? (laughs) Now, to be fair, some of us can't drink regular cow's milk, and that's okay. You guys can have all the almond milk you want, all the oat milk. That's all right. But next time you see that in the store, be reminded, right, that God can bring water from a rock. Fortunately, we can only bring milk from almonds, right? Testing God 
is asking for proof, a sign of unbelief. Now, just like our children can test us, we can also test God by asking for signs. Lord, if your promises are true, just give me this sign. Just change this circumstance. These are the kind of deals we make with God in asking for proof. But we must keep our hearts soft to the Lord. We can heed his voice. We can hear it in the wilderness, just like it said in Psalm 95. Do not harden your hearts. For your ancestors tested me. They tried me. So if we hear his voice, don't harden our hearts, right? Do not dwell on despair, but instead have hope. When we get to these difficult times in our life, when we don't know what's down that windy road, when we're waiting to get to that destination, remember the Lord's promises and have hope. Hope is what fights against despair. Hope is what fights against the laziness to not want to be active in taking responsibility for our attitudes and actions. Hope is what we have as God's people, both in the Old Testament and how much more today when the new covenant of Christ. We sing these songs asking for Jesus to come again. Do you have hope that he will return? That there will be a new heavens and a new earth? There will be no more thirst and no more hunger and no more tears, no more pain. This is the living hope that we have. So let us not be outraged. Let us not be angry and complain and grumble. But let us have hope. And in that hope, do something about it, right? Take responsibility for our attitudes and actions in that moment and turn to the Lord in prayer. And ask him, Lord, what should we do about this situation? Don't dwell on despair, but instead have hope. So I ask you, how can you practice hope today? What can you do today to put hope into practice? To show that your hope is living. That God is calling you to a life of hope and not of despair and grumbling and complaining. The last thing I want to talk about is how can we live all of this out together? We, as a church, are a family, and so we must heed his voice. Our worship should include the reading and the expounding upon of scriptures. That's why I asked you guys to use your voices today, because we want to hear his voice in whatever wilderness that we're crossing. As a church and as worshipers, we will hear his voice when we read the Bible, when we read his word. So when you're feeling like you're in despair, turn to God's word. Turn to his scripture and hear his voice. He has something that he wants to tell you. He wants to lift your hearts high. He does not want you to be alone in the wilderness. God does not want you to be hungry and thirsty in the wilderness. He wants to guide you through that wilderness so he can come to his rest. This is one of my most favorite words talking about what we call the end of things, right? Is God's rest. I don't know about you, but I love taking naps. In fact, I have a couch in my office, which I call my nap couch. Because rest is important. Sabbath is important. And God is calling his people to enter his rest. But in order to get there, do not despair. But have hope so that we may enter his rest. So that the strivings will cease And we can see Christ face to face. And our hope will be real in a much realer way than we experience now. Do not neglect meeting together and encouraging one another to have soft hearts. Maybe you have friends or a community group. Keep meeting together and encourage one another to have hearts that are soft to the Lord. Encourage one another to be responsive to the voice of God when you read and study his word. Now, a very famous wizard once said, There are all kinds of courage, Dumbledore said, smiling. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. Is it easy to stand up to one another? It can be very hard, but I encourage you guys to call each other out when you're facing despair and laziness. To call each other out and have courage and have hope in those difficult times. 
We need to hold each other accountable to our own outrage, to our own echo chambers that we find ourselves in. It's easy to get stuck in a negative feedback loop of complaining and grumbling and outraging over the same things. But we should be known for what we are for. We are for Christ. We are for love. We are for hope. Not all the things that we're against. Not all the things that we're complaining and grumbling about. God assured Moses that he would keep him safe. Now, how many of your friends want to stone you when you call them out? Any? Not quite that dire. But in Exodus 17, Moses comes to the Lord and says, What do I do with these people? They're about to kill me. And so God says, Don't worry. I will go before the rock at Horeb. Now, the Lord's presence was that giant pillar of cloud. And that would stand there by the rock so that the people wouldn't just complain to the management anymore. Because here's the power. Here's God drawing water from the rock. Here is his presence. Here is his power. Have hope. God provided protection for Moses from the quarrying people of Israel, but it was also a demonstration of his power. And that power reminds us of his ability to keep his promises. The reason that we can have hope today is because we know that Christ is greater than sin and death and any troubles in this world that we might face. So we know that in our present circumstances, we can have hope that he will keep his promises. Now, as a father, I don't always keep all my promises. And to my children, I am sorry. But we know that the Lord keeps every last promise. We know that things will come to fruition. We know that things will be fulfilled in his time, in his way. But oh, is it so easy to grumble and complain along the way. So, as we leave here today for Mother's Day, let us not complain to our moms, right? <laughs> let us honor our father and our mother so that it will go well with us in the land, right? Speaking of the promised land. And so let us honor our mothers and let us honor God by having hope by striving for what God wants us to be. Just like parents, we all have things that we hoped our children would be. But God actually wants to make us into a people, a living people with living hope whose hearts are soft to the Lord, right? So let us pray, and then we'll continue in worship. Let's put our hands together, and let's think about God as we talk to him. Heavenly Father, we come before you praising you, Lord, thanking you, Lord, for all of your blessings. Lord, you give us so much through your son, Jesus. You give us hope. You give us peace. You give us life everlasting. Lord, you are our shelter in times of need. You are our strength. You are our rock. Lord, we thank you that you are always here forgiving us and loving us. And Father, I pray that we could be your faithful servants, Lord, that we would listen to your Holy Spirit to guide us as your sheep, Lord. We pray that we will hear your voice. You are our shepherd, and we are your sheep, and you are our God, and we love you. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.